Okay, we have another last words of a man of God in the Bible. Last words are, are recorded. Moses, Paul, Jesus. And they're pretty much good words. Joshua 24. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. That's interesting because that's a Levitical city of refuge. They're not where uh, Shiloh. You would think he would call them in, in, where in Shiloh. And yeah, we're going to come to close of this chapter uh, another weird verse about the location. But in Shechem, that's where Jacob was. Where Jacob shouldn't have been. That's where Dinah was raped. And called for the elders of Israel and for their heads, for their judges, for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Now, when you read the notes of other writers that say, because this was the central location, I don't think Joshua would have done that. I don't think Joshua had done anything convenient. I don't know why we're not at Shiloh. Again, like I said, we're going to come to a verse then in this chapter even weirder. Verse 2, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. That flood could be the, Euph the Euphrates River. It flooded. And we're going to see other floods. It could be also the Nile River, where, each, uh, where not only in Egypt, not only in uh, the, the Ur of Chaldees, this is where the people were. They were in the Ur of Chaldees, Abraham, Israel was in Egypt, and there are two rivers that flooded. This is not the flood of, of uh, Noah. The fathers dwell on the other side of the flood in old time. That would be Abraham. Even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nicol, and they served other gods. Look at that. Abraham did not serve God the, of the Bible his entire life. He lived in the city Ur Chaldees, which was given to the moon goddess. You know, the moon that represents the Muslims who claim to be of Abraham, but they're of Abram and of Ishmael. They're not of Abraham. Abraham's name was changed after Ishmael was born and before Isaac was born. And it's funny how they still carry on with the moon sign of the God of Abram and Terah. And their father Nicor and they served other gods. And I, God, took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, that would be the Euphrates, and led him through all the land of Canaan. And we read the stories in Genesis. And multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. Now what are we doing? What is Joshua doing that is not being done today? He is giving the Jews the, his, his last words. He is giving the history of the nation of Israel. History must be important for these men of God and the Holy Spirit to record that this is what had happened. He gathers all the heads, and they should know this. And he's reconfirming what God had done to their fathers and what God has done to them. America is not doing that today. They're changing and erasing. And I gave, this is God speaking, unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. No Ishmael mentioned at all. Even Esau, where God says, Jacob I have loved, Esau have I hated. Esau is mentioned by Joshua, but not Ishmael. That's quite relevant. Because the Bible records later on in one of the minor prophets that God said, I hate Esau. And yet Joshua brings up those two brothers. He didn't bring up the brother of, of Isaac. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. 
But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Now we're leaving Genesis. We're leaving the end of Genesis and we're coming to Exodus. Joshua knows his history. And he's reconfirming to the children of Israel. We ought to be doing that. The Lord's Supper that we're supposed to be part of the church is supposed to remind us of the death, burial, and resurrection and the life of Jesus Christ. And yet, look forward to Jesus coming. History is very important in the Bible. And I sent Moses, also in Aaron. Well, because Moses had an argument with God. I, I can't speak. I'm not eloquent. Well, isn't your brother? And I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward, I brought you out. Look at, look at Joshua. He's saying God did everything in the book of Exodus. God used Moses and Aaron, but he did it work. Now, if you remember the plague of Egypt, God, I plague of Egypt. Moses, raise your rod. Moses, take some dust and throw it up in the air. And Joshua says, God. But don't forget Moses and Aaron. This would not be likened in your public school system because we're not giving names to Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and all, even those names are probably deleted from the school. But God. You know, one of the first things they did when they do the story of the pilgrims, they, they forget to say that God protected them on that ship, the Mayflower. There were several times that Mayflower should have wrecked one of the times that the main mast broke. And they used one of the parts of the printing press that produced Bibles to fix that ship to come over here. That God wiped out an entire tribe or, or, or village, whatever you want to call it. And that village being wiped out had food reserves for the pilgrims when they came. That's God. And yet there was a captain of that ship. There was, there was a leader of the pilgrims. But God brought them over here to this land. And God established them here. And man went wrong, as the story will be with judges. Yes, America was a Christian nation with the Geneva Bible. Joshua's children of Israel here are under God, a nation approved of God, and they'll fall. They'll fail. As America has. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt. And he came onto the sea, Red Sea, and the Egyptians pursued after you, after your fathers, with chariots and horsemen onto the Red Sea. Right, Joshua was there for that. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. Wow, he really recorded and brought the sea upon them and covered them wow well, he left out that the sea parted and they went on dry land why would he leave that out why would he remind them about the egyptians being drowned israel i'm going away of death i'm going to die you still got the enemy out there and if god can drown pharaoh if God can get rid of Pharaoh, and I lost a Christian friend on this because God did kill Pharaoh and the Egyptians, you can better believe he'll, he'll get rid of the Philistines, he'll get rid of the Canaanites, he'll get rid of the Jebusites, he'll get rid of all those people for you. You let God be in control. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. That's God speaking, not Joshua. He dwelled in the wilderness a long season. And I, God, brought you into a land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand, that ye might possess their land. And I, God, destroyed them before you. Look at God. Look at Joshua. God, 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 God. God did all that. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, rose and warred against Israel. 
and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Wow. Joshua knew what happened in the book of Numbers. But I, God, would not hearken unto Balaam. Matter of fact, God put a word in his mouth and said, bless them. What do you mean you're going to bless them? I sent you to curse them. Try it again. All right. God is going to bless that nation, and blessed are those that bless him, and cursed be that cursed it. Ah, twice. I sent you to curse him. And then the third time. I would not hearken unto Balaam. That is God speaking. Do you see what the power of Balaam had with God? God would have hearkened to Balaam except for, this, except for the request of Balak. And when you go back in Numbers and when you read the story, and he says that you can curse people and you can bless people, I'm hiring you to curse people. And he would say, I am going only to speak with the mouth of God. And yes, Balaam fell by the money and, and the profit and the fame of Balak. But God said, but I would not hearken unto Balaam. And God tried to stop Balaam from going because God knew Balaam was going to fail by the talking ass story. Therefore, he blessed you still three times. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. Joshua, where's the 40 years in the wilderness? That's missing like Hebrews. We go right from Moses, then we go right to Rahab. That's the same thing Joshua does you find in Hebrews. There is no recorded of 40 years in the wilderness. There is no calling the earth opening up and swallowing. There is no record of the, the serpent. Look and live. We're right at Jericho. And he went over Jordan and came went into Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. That's kind of interesting because there is no recorded of, of the soldier. It records that the walls fell down and Israel went in and conquered. And Joshua is telling us that there was a fight. Once those walls came out and Israel was coming over, Jericho, the heavens, are trying to fight them from coming over. And the men of Jericho fought against us, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I, God, delivered them into your hand. Well, wouldn't you think Joshua said, I'm the one that did it? The entire book of Joshua has been Joshua going in and fighting the land and dividing the land. You think Joshua would say, I did it. And he did say, I did it. But not I, Joshua, I, God. What's wrong with you, Joshua? Are you giving that's what's wrong with America today. We're not giving God the credit. When 9-11, when those towers came down, President Bush said, Let's have a time of prayer. And with all the activities and all the terror, all, all the troubles and all the problems, even under President Trump, when had they said, Let's have a national prayer? Bush said, Let's get us into our churches and let's pray. I remember we did that. I remember what we were called to church. It was not a church night. And we went in there and we prayed for the nation. We're not doing that today. We got all these people being killed by guns and not once have anybody said, let's get into churches and pray. Obama and Trump. We're not giving God the credit. We're not giving God the thanks. And we're going to be in trouble. If we're not thanking God for the food and wasting the food that he's giving us, there's going to be a day when there'll be no food. And I, God, sent the hornet before you. You mean God's in charge of the bees? You mean God whispers in that hornet, go over there and attack that guy? And today we got a big problem with the honeybees. They're dying off. I think God's doing it. Because we're not thanking him for the food. And we're wasting food in this country. God had control over an ass. He said, I got a message for you. Open your mouth and speak. And he said to the ravens, I got some, want you to grab some food and I want you to go feed a man by a river. And they did. 
He says, I want that dove. I want you to go over there and grab that olive leaf. Of all the bushes, all the plants, it has to be that olive leaf you're to grab. And it did. Jesus did uh, got upon that ass that's never been rolled again, and that ass carried him through the city. God has control over the animals. He created them, which dragged them out from before you, the, the hornets. The hornets drove the soldiers out that God told them, I sent. Even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow or bow. Well, look at that. Look at something we learned there. Hornets got the victory. God did it. And I have given you the land for which ye did not labor. When they came in there, the houses were built, the vineyards were there, the fields were there. All they had to do is take occupation. I preach, that's one of, that's one of the uh, second message I ever preach. That land was fully prepared for them. All they had to go was up, up and say, you see that house over there? You, okay, I like that house. It's mine. Whatever the gardens was, whatever was there, whatever animals were there, it was theirs. They didn't have to build. And cities which you built not, they were there. And he dwelled in them. Of the vineyards and the olive yards, which ye planted not, do you eat? Do ye eat? You didn't plant those, but you're joining them. God used the enemy of Israel to provide for Israel when they came in the land. How's that? That guy would go out in the fields, he would trim his plants, he would pick the weeds, he would do everything he needed to take care of that garden and realize he's going to die, and an Israelite, a child of God, is going to take over. That's a picture of the millennium. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. There's no fear of the Lord today. And serve him in sincerity. Wow. And in truth. And put away the gods. This is going to come up a little bit later at the end of this chapter. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood. And in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. So it's definitely the Euphrates and the Nile River. And they're carrying those gods of Ur. They're carrying those gods of Egypt. They're carrying those gods of the Canaanites. And Joshua is telling right now, drop them as Jacob told them. That Rachel stole and grew. Now history. Now we're passing. We're present tense. You got those gods, get rid of them. We don't need them. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, whoa. Choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood. That's our history. Our history comes, our fathers had gods. Is that what you want? Choose. Or the gods of the Amorites. How about the ones in the land right now? You're going to see the kings worshiping those gods. In whose land ye dwell? Solomon. But as for me, here's the verse, in my house... There's no asking anybody. Anybody's going to be in my house. Anybody's going to live in my house. We will serve the Lord. That's a heritage. That's a home. After doing history. And he asked his wife nothing. He asked his children nothing. He asked his servants nothing. He spoke up as a man in the house. They were going to serve God. And there are people today who have that. Well, that's for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. They got it in their house. They got it on the walls. And they serve other gods. They lost the whole point. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. That's, that's a hypocrite. 
as we get later in this chapter, a few more verses, we're going to see that is a hypocritical statement by the children of Israel. For the Lord our God, he is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt. Okay, they know the history, but they're not living it. From the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way wherein we went, and among all the people through whom we passed. Okay, we got the history down. But they're not living it. And the Lord drive out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwell in the land. Therefore we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, after they speak, Now last time he spoke, he says, Get rid of those gods. And the people speak. Now Joshua speaks up again. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord. Well, we'll serve God. We'll take it. We'll love God. We'll do. And Joshua comes right out and points him in the face. You can't serve God. But isn't that what you just told us to do? Yes. But he told you to get rid of those gods. Make a choice right now. Do you want the gods or do you want God? Oh, we want God. He said, you can't serve the Lord. For he's a holy God. He is a jealous God. Now remember the jealous that we've read in the book of Moses? God is jealous when you have other gods. And we're going to build upon this statement. We're looking at false gods now from verse 14. You know why Joshua from chapter 24 verse 1 to 13, you know why he gave that specific History, because it all involves gods. He said, well, what about Egypt? What about those plagues? Those were all upon the gods of the Egyptians. The Nile, it's a god. The, the magicians were the gods. The Pharaoh was the god. The flies were gods. Their fathers worshipped gods. They came into Jericho, they had gods. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sin. What is those sins that he said in the Ten Commandments? I am not going to forgive you to the third and fourth generation of your children. Idols. Images. Aids to worship. Again, we come to the thing that God is not into statues and pictures. If you forsake the Lord. How do you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods? Ooh. You know what a strange God would be to the true Baptist church of Jesus Christ? Gods of the heathen. Gods of the, of the Catholic church. Gods of, of the world. Toys. Those are supposed to be strange gods to Bible believers. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. Then he will turn and do you hurt. Imagine God. Imagine Joshua saying, you know what the Lord? If you turn to those you forsaken, he'll do you hurt. Can you even picture God doing that? What God can do to your life to do you hurt. And there are some things, some diseases, some troubles, some problems in your life because you have forsaken the Lord for a strange God. Even Paul tells us about the Lord's Supper. If you don't do it right, there are people who are asleep, dead. There are people who are sickly. Because they have not honored the Lord's Supper. And one of the things, if you forsake God, and you find it in the New Testament too, if you forsake God, God can do you hurt. Hebrews chapter 12, as God is our Father, as an earthly Father, chastising us, that does hurt. And consume you. <laughs> Make you gone. Not perish, but dissolve you. After that, he, God, has done you good. After all the good that God done you, and you forsake him, he'll do you hurt, and he'll consume you. 
consumed would also be like some of these diseases that, you know what, it's done. You can't do nothing about it. Leprosy was one in the Bible. That would just consume your flesh and eat you up. There was a couple people who had their bellies just rotted out. Because you did forsake the Lord. And the people said, okay, now the people speak in. Unto Joshua, nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua again said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. We looked at this back when we talked about Ed, the, the altar of witness, the great altar. He said, all right, you guys are witnesses. You said you're going to serve God. Two times. Out of the mouth of two or three people, Joshua said, that's a witness. He's putting the people under an oath. And it's sorry because he knows what the people are doing. He knows they're not going to get right. Against yourself and you have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, the people speak, we are witnesses. That's an oath. So help me God. Joshua now speaks again. Now, therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods. Verse 20. Ready? Which are among you? We're going to serve God. And they got it hanging from their neck. They got it on their bracelets. They're carrying it in their luggage. It's probably standing next to them. They have the idolatry and the imagery and the strange gods right with them in the congregation. Maybe that's why he didn't make them go to Shiloh. The strange gods are among you. And you just made a witness to yourself saying, but the strange gods, we're going to serve God and we're going to do right. They're right there. Incline your heart. It's a heart condition, not a head. Unto the Lord God of Israel. Put them away. And the people said, now here's the people again, unto Joshua, the Lord our God will we serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua, is the Holy Spirit missing something here? If you don't think the Holy Spirit is missing something, let's go to Genesis 35, 4. Genesis chapter 35, verse 4. Genesis 35, 4. It's amazing how scripture was scripture. We'll start in verse 1. 35, 1. And God said to Jacob, oh, here's God speaking. He was speaking in Joshua 24. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. And make there an altar unto God. Because there's where God tells them to make an altar. There is no tabernacle yet. There's no Ark of the Covenant. That, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, thy brother. And then Jacob said unto the household. As Joshua was speaking to his household, the children of Israel. And to all that were with him. Put away the What? That's exactly what Joshua said. Strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. Whoa, and garments there. Something wrong with the worldly garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God. So they're not where, where his altar is. Joshua is not where the, where the Ark of the Covenant is. There's a broken down altar in Bethel and they're not there. He's going to go there. Now that's interesting because when we read a little further in Joshua, they are in Shechem where, they, where Jacob was. They're not in Shiloh. Jacob is not in Bethel. But he's going to go to Bethel. Make an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress. And I was and was with me in the way which I went. 
And they gave, now watch this, watch the recording. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which are in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So the Holy Spirit records in Genesis 35, they gave up the strands, gods. They gave them to Jacob. Jacob bear, bear, uh, digs a hole and buries them under an oak and covers it. He told them, you got strange gods, get rid of them. And they did. And when we come to Joshua 24, verse 20, you got strange gods, get rid of them. And the people said, Joshua, verse 24, the Lord our God will we serve, and his voice we will we will obey. So Joshua made a cut. There is no recorded of them giving up those idols. But there was in Genesis 35. They did not get right. That's the church age today. They're not giving up their idols. They're not giving up the strange gods. They love them. But we want to serve God too. Now watch. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day. Made an agreement. And set them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. They're still in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. That's what we just read. In Joshua. And took a great stone. There was a great altar a couple chapters ago. Now watch this. You think Joshua doesn't know his history? And set it up there under an oak. What did Jacob do under an oak in chapter 35? He buried those idols. He buried those strange gods. Joshua couldn't do that here. Because they did not give up their strange gods. Instead he puts a stone. A great stone. And then it says that it was by the sanctuary of the Lord. 26 is a new chapter. As far as we read, that Ark of the Covenant that was not in Shechem. It was in Shiloh. And I don't know, but did Joshua walk away from Shechem that day? Said, I'm, going to, I'm going to Shiloh where the sanctuary is and I'm going to leave there with this stone that he did. I don't know. Unless they carry the ark to check them, but the sanctuary of the Lord. I don't understand that. Somebody or something moved between 25 and 26. Either they brought the ark there. Or Joshua left Shechem in defeat. Josh, I mean, Jacob left and went to Bethel where the altar was. And I'm going to think if he's following what Jacob did, Joshua left Shechem and went to Shiloh where the Lord is. And, and Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness. That great stone is a witness. Remember that great altar was a witness? He's rebuking them with that great altar too. For it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spanked. What heard the words of the Lord which he spanked? Stones are capable of recording. The old cassette tapes, I don't understand how they but there's stone in that. And Jesus said, if, if you hush them up, even the stones will cry out. These stones that Joshua Grant recorded, and they record what the children of Israel said that day. And it's a testimony against Israel for what? They did not get rid of those gods. In Jacob's time, there was nothing to be spoken because Jacob said, give them up, and they handed it to him. And he builds a hole, or digs a hole, and buries and he's not going to leave a stone there because he does not want anybody to find it. We're not even told where he was, where that, where that tree is. That oak tree. 
This is weird. Where is this oak tree? Is it in Shechem or is it in Shiloh? I don't know. But the souls cry out, and shall be therefore a witness unto you. I thought that Ed was a witness. I think it's in Shechem. Yeah. And set it up there. There. So it's got to be Shechem. The sanctuary of the Lord, then, uh, because it's a city of refuge. But there was a great altar that was Ed, was a witness. I think that also built into a worship, too. Not only the strange gods. Least you deny your God. And they have. Book of Judges, they will. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. They all go home. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. That's old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnathshirah which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaish. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, even with their idols, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, chapter 24, verse 1, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for them. It probably kept history going. They probably kept the story of the Lord going and kept the hope going. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in the partial ground which Jacob brought for his sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Joseph said, carry my bones out. And as Christians, we learn here, we may die in this world and they may bury us. But in the event of the rapture, our bones are not staying in Egypt. Joshua will carry our bones over. And if it's physical, really, the bones and, the, and the, those graves are going to pop open. And this also happened when Jesus died and the veil was rent into two. It says, the Bible says, the bodies of the Old Testament saints arose and were walking around Jerusalem probably all the days that Jesus was walking around. It's happened before. Lazarus came out of that grave, not a spirit, but bones. That boy that was in the beard, the coffin, that his mother was crying, and Jesus touched the beard and he came alive with, with his bones. And it looks like the fact is that the dead in Christ shall raise first, and that may be a moment of time. Man, if you're by a graveyard and the rapture happens, that Trump, you're going to see something weird. Something weird is going to happen in graveyards. And would it be weird if you, you're living in an in a area that people, if they have believed on God, if they've been buried under your house or in your yard? You're a Christian, you're out in the porch, you're out in your porch, or you're out working the garden, you're mowing the lawn, and here comes a body straight up. You better get over to your neighbors and start witnessing about witness to them right away. Buddy, you need to believe on Christ right now. Quick, hurry. Our bones are not going to be left on the Jesus' bones are not left. And buried him Shechem on partial of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor. And the father of Shechem for a hundred pieces of, for a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. That's got a bad history there for Jacob. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died. And they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phineas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. So everybody's dying off. We're going to pick up a new generation, the book of Judges, in a few chapters. And we're going to see a nation a mess.